There we go. All right. So I'm going to walk you through a very brief introduction. Um, and then we're going to go directly into Canvas so I can show you um, uh, what exactly it is that uh, I just noticed a typo from the flyer, but um, what exactly is the final product? If we were together, I would have all of us in one of our computer rooms on campus so that you could navigate uh, the modules. And I call, I titled this module mania because um, basically from Thanksgiving through early January, this is all I did. I lived, breathed, um, dreamt and slept, you know, this course. And it's been one of the most rewarding pedagogical experiences I've had. And I wanna start off by thanking Vicki, um, Richard and Jamie, who gave me this opportunity and supported me all along um, to create the materials. And um, and it, those of you that don't know, Vicki is the Associate Dean um, of Curriculum uh, here in SLA, School of Liberal Arts. And then Richard Matazar works under the president and he's one of the vice presidents. And then also Jamie Northrup is also one of the I, I believe you're a vice president as well, correct? Are you? Associate um, vice president, yep. Associate vice president, okay. But I say this, you know, just to let you know that this is a course that had, that that involved a lot of people. So I start with that. And I also wanna thank Adrian um, and Charles who, who have helped organize uh, with me this series of brown bags. So I sometimes there is an issue when I do the full screen. So I might just go through uh, my brief slides in this format. And then whenever we get over to um, the Canvas modules, I will share the entire screen. So let me start here and tell you a little bit um, about this course. I wanna tell you about what the course is, has been up to this point. This is my fourth year as the director of the Spanish language program. I have been teaching language since I was in graduate school at Yale. Um, I was trained in both literature and language acquisition. And I've been through a variety, a plethora of different programs. I've taught it um, at Brandeis, I taught at Penn, uh, I taught at Yale, and then now I'm here. So I only mention those universities because it gives you a sense for sort of an, a growing appreciation for different approaches uh, to language acquisition. So, here at Tulane, um, the Spanish 2030 course, which is the one that I decided to um, reformulate, if you will, rethink for an online uh, module delivery is an intermediate Spanish course. So this would be a course um, that is very popular with incoming first year students. It does satisfy the Newcomb Tulane College language requirements. It has a proficiency goal um, of intermediate mid. And what does that mean to those of you who are not familiar with the actual um, proficiency goals? It means that you know students can engage in paragraph length discourse ideally, but they're talking about familiar and predictable topics that are related to their basic needs. They can talk about themselves. They can talk about their daily routine. They can talk about um, elements that pertain directly to their existence and they can survive in a target speaking language with these for these basic needs and with these basic needs. They can answer questions and they can be, this is very important, they can be understood by a native speaker who is familiar with language learners. So that means somebody who has taught in the past and has some sense of what it means to acquire a second language. So I put that out there so that you will understand how it is that we approach this course. Now, traditionally, um, the course, and by traditionally, I mean here at Tulane within the Spanish language program, the methodology has been as follows. And I was trained in communicative language teaching right when it was coming out. Um, I was, I'm, it's one of the foundations of my whole um, academic and intellectual career, which was that training. I think it transfers and dialogues with all kinds of uh, disciplines, and there's a lot of overlap. Um, between language acquisition and then other connections that we want our students to make. So I recognize fully that there are many different approaches to language acquisition, but I, with adaptations along the way, 
am very true to communicative um, comprehension based language teaching. Now, what does that mean? That means that we teach entirely in the target language, meaning that in our Spanish 1010 courses, which is our introductory course for students that have never studied Spanish before, they walk in and they are greeted on that first day in Spanish. And it is one of the most difficult courses to teach, Spanish 1010, because it is a flagship course in which we have constant interaction with our students. And I think this is really important to understand that our language courses, the basic language courses from 1010 all the way through 2030 are some of the most important courses for our incoming students. That is, they have the most face time and direct contact with their professor or instructor um, comparatively to other disciplines. So, and the classes are small, relatively speaking, and I like to compare it to calculus, which is another overwhelmingly large course where there all are smaller sections. And of course, math being a language as well. We, have, we can think of that type of connection. So I just highlight that because I think often the perception is, oh, language, it doesn't matter. It's one of those intro courses. You satisfy the requirement and you get out. But for the university as a whole, this is an opportunity to talk about our university, engage with our students, learn about them and have them learn about us and Tulane. So that was sort of my starting principle. Um, and of course, the question is, how do I couple that, marry that to my linguistic language acquisition goals for the whole program? So once again, just to those of you who are linguists and language teachers, this is very basic, but the input and output, that is what we say and what we have our students hear and then create, say back to us, in our language classes, we cover all the communication skills. So reading, writing, listening, um, and of course, speaking. I always like to go abide by the input plus one. In other words, you teach, you, you speak to your students in a slightly more advanced um, linguistic way than what they might want you to. In other words, we don't slow down our language. We speak and try to recreate a native uh, speaking environment as much as possible in our classrooms. And that will eventually ideally lead to them speaking more, okay? Um, and of course, we adhere to ACTFL's um, standards for learning languages. And this is where the connections, which are the foundation for this new um, module come from communication, cultures, connections, comparisons, and communities. So this is foundational for what we're going to see in the actual course. Now, the new module structure, and I call it module because it is organized entirely by the module structure within Canvas. And we do all of this, I'll explain to you when we are actually in Canvas why I chose to do that. But of course we have our target proficiency goals. We wanna maintain those. We basically wanna maintain everything that was on um, the methodology list, but simultaneously showcase Tulane, showcase New Orleans, and everything we have to offer. And what I hope to do in this presentation is answer the question, why do this? I think once again, this is an extraordinary opportunity to reach a large number of students um, that are coming or thinking about coming to our campus if they're summer students or high school students eventually. Now, each module has a core, uh, narrative or conversational video. And where does this come from? Um, research shows that watching films, videos, television programs, um, et cetera, can enhance conversational skills in the target language, improve listening and reading comprehension, foster cultural interest and in social engagement, and improve pronunciation and affect. The way I was trained to teach and the way I train the graduate students and new instructors in my methodology course is a, I wouldn't call it a formula, but a format that starts with a brief narration as if you're talking, having a conversation with them. It is a very well formatted introduction that students don't realize 
you know, is, is constructed in that way if it's done well, but every class opens with banter between the instructor, professor, and the students that is carefully crafted to include the um, pedagogical goal of that day. So whenever we shifted um, to online during COVID back in March and everyone was in crisis, and this was long before these modules um, were in development, I saw this as a, as a tremendous opportunity for a paradigm shift. How do we recreate what has been working in the language classroom, in my case, for decades, and use this new medium, which is Zoom, to recreate that yet in a different way. So we're recreating, yet we're shifting at the same time. So we have, um, and that was my challenge. That's what I saw my challenge last March when we had to shift very quickly. All, we had over a thousand students who immediately were put online, 26 instructors who had to move online. And this was, for those of us that are language directors, this was something that we had to manage, um, you know, wholeheartedly and, and with gusto. So my core element of the videos that were graciously approved by Jamie and Richard, um, their professional videos, they aim to create that linguistic environment for our students. And I will show you exactly how we're doing that um, in a few moments. But each video is then accompanied by previewing activities and post viewing activities. And we'll come back to this slide after we take a look at, um, at, the, at the modules themselves. So I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and jump into um, the modules, if you hold on just a second, so you can see. And I think for those of you who have been involved in this uh, process, and that also includes Vicki, who I forgot to mention um, in, my, in my last uh, reference to the modules, th this, is what, this is the final product. This is what the students are getting, and this is what the university is getting. And it's something that I'm very proud of and still needs to be tweaked a bit um, as a new course often does, but it, so far it is working quite well. So when the students log on, they see this. Um, of course, ideally, I would love to see it more colorful, but we've worked with what we have in Canvas. And um, from what I understand, Canvas is one of the best platforms. So um, whenever those of us who use Canvas a lot think of problems, I think comparatively, Tulane has chosen one of the best uh, educational platforms for, for us. And it seems to have improved dramatically once we all shifted uh, to Zoom. So they open um, you know, with a map. You would be surprised at how many students do not know uh, the Spanish speaking countries. So it's just a basic you know, map that we go back to at various points um, throughout the semester, but they're greeted by um, a welcome. Now, I'm not gonna show a lot of this video. Um, I don't particularly like seeing myself on screen, but I just want you to get a sense for what it, how I tried to incorporate what I would do on the first day of class. And then I wanna uh, make a parenthesis about how it differs as well. So this is a, um, well, it should be. The video is, uh, is appears to, now there we go. So this is me. Hello and welcome to Spanish 2030. I'm your professor, Roxanne Davila, and I wanted to welcome you to the course and also to tell you a little bit about myself. Okay. Et cetera, et cetera. This is in English because we have incoming first year students who might not have taken Spanish, who were taught their, you know, their, their language courses were taught in English, as strange as that sounds, it happens all the time. So the goal of the welcome video is truly to welcome them to the class. Now, um, I look a little crazy in that video, but I do reveal certain things, certain um, elements that are personal that I would tell students, you know, about in that first class in order to create a certain element of familiarity. You know, there's, a, there's that boundary between what you cross and what you don't cross, but we see our students more than probably most classes do. And because we are acquiring language, we talk about ourselves. Students learn best whenever they are talking about themselves and whenever the topics presented to them are related to their life. So everything that, um, here it is, right here, right here, everything that the students need is found in the modules. 
the entire course, what would be the equivalent to the calendar for the syllabus is contained with the modules. For this particular course, we do not actually have a PDF of the day by day. They rely entirely on the modules and surprisingly, to me at least, I wasn't raised in the digital era. So not having a paper as organization is new, entirely new to me. The students who are pretty much born with an iPhone in their hands, an iPad, have been able to navigate the modules extremely well. Now, what do we do on our first day of class? We talk about ourselves. So here's about the course. It gives them, you know, very basic information about the course, um, you know, that they find on the syllabus. The general syllabus is a legal contract. So, um, students do uh, you know, get a PDF of the actual syllabus, just not the calendar. Now, this is, this is some information about me. This is who I am, where I studied, where I've taught, but what they like to learn, I've found, and this is in English because it is the introduction to the course, is they like to know unique things about you. And these are things that I generally incorporate throughout the course, but here I just put them up front to humanize that relationship between someone in an authority position as a teacher, professor, and the students. Because we want our students to be able to talk freely and openly and overcome the anxiety that's inherent to language acquisition. That's what everybody needs to remember. I always tell my students when they talk about their anxiety is that that is inherent to language acquisition. You cannot express yourself and that leads to anxiety, but the more you speak, the easier it becomes. Um, so I grew up uh, between the two countries. I have two miniature dachshunds and an axolotl. My daughter loves axolotls. They're Mexican water salamanders, um, which in is incorporated into my class. I almost became a violinist and I write in music. So these are just elements that I, when I'm introducing myself, that I give to my students either throughout the course um, or whenever it's relevant to the pedagogical elements. Now I want to jump into the actual pedagogy. Um, we have rubrics, student expectations, um, and of course Zoom rules and Zoom etiquette and discussion board etiquette. So if anybody wants to talk about those um, documents, we can talk about those another time, but I do find it absolutely crucial to outline the parameters of what's expected of students um, in the classroom and then of course the parameters for participation in discussion boards. Um, so every module has a preguntas y dudas. This is a place where students can go and post any, any questions, any confusion they have about where to find, a confusion about assignments, etc. So every single module has one of those. It's like questions uh, and suggestions in English. We start that off in English. The first three modules of the course have instructions in English. At module four, everything shifts into Spanish. Why do I do that? I do that once again because of the large number of first year students who are coming in. I want them to be familiar with the structure of Canvas so that then when we go entirely into the target language, they have recall of what the content is, so then they can make that connection uh, to the target language. Now I'm gonna go through the uh, Relaciones Personales, so it's about relationships, um, the first module, but the second module is one that I think is of a, a particular interest and it actually highlights two of the videos that were made. So the topic for module two, which follows our book, is the city. Now, what do we have here at Tulane that uh, is, as much or almost as much of an attraction as Tulane. We have New Orleans. Um, New Orleans is like New York. Either you love it or you don't do it. Um, having lived in New York and being, I'm married to a New Yorker, I can say that his, his one love aside from New York um, and the Maya area is New Orleans. So it's a special place. Um, and I think that we have once again, a tremendous opportunity to showcase what our connection to our community is um, and what the culture of New Orleans is. So I see also this particular module um, as an opportunity to also 
connect students to the history of New Orleans. So in the class A, a prepararse en la ciudad, I think it's this one, uh, we have a video that is right here and a rather awkward, let me go back here. And these are professionally made videos, so. La Universidad de Tulane se fundó en 1834 y se encuentra en la ciudad de Nueva Orleans. Para entender la historia de Tulane, hay que conocer un poco de la historia de la ciudad. Antes de que llegaran los europeos, el territorio conocido hoy en día como Nueva Orleans pertenecía a varios grupos indígenas que vivían al borde del río Mississippi. Okay, and it goes on and on through the history of New Orleans. Now, how long is it? It's four minutes. That is very long for a listening comprehension, okay? It is broken down in the classroom into 30 second maximum one minute um, snippets of the video in which we do interaction, question and answer, we do concept um, maps, follow-ups, etc. What am I doing here in each one of these? And I stopped here because we have the map of all of the indigenous groups. If you ask most of our undergraduate students, maybe not all of them, but most of them, uh, they would be hard pressed to name more than one of our indigenous groups. This is a time in which diversity and inclusion is at center stage and it's a wonderful time for that. So the opportunity in which we talk about, or should I say the sh showcasing New Orleans also allows us to talk about references to slavery, references to indigenous. And so in this particular, and I'm gonna go uh, here actually to the, how do these activities correspond to the video? Um, I don't know why it's not showing up, there we go. Okay, so after each video for comprehension, okay, and they are broken up into sm much smaller segments, which gives us more teaching time and aligns much better with what we would be doing if we were able to be in person. Um, and I, as I developed these, I was also thinking, how can they function simultaneously with in-person classes and continue to service an online program? Because I don't see our return to campus and return to in-person teaching as the end of online teaching. I think that it, it's, once again, it bore all of these opportunities that can be continued to develop. So one of the um, elements that we see in each module, almost all the modules is sequencing. So how do we check for comprehension in a way that is different from inserting questions um, about the videos, having them do pre-viewing activities is that they organize, for example, in this case, um, let's see, Jean-Baptiste Funda Nuevo Orleans, and then, you know, it goes, I talk also, excuse me, that's wrong, um, Grupos Indígenas al Borde, um, and et cetera. They go through, and these are graded as complete or incomplete, but you are checking for comprehension before they come to class. Okay, so they listen to different parts at different times. It's broken up, maximum of four segments, uh, excuse me, maximum time period of one minute per segment. And then they go through and they confirm or verify that they have um, understood the history of New Orleans. Okay, and it's very basic because in four minutes you can only do so much. Um, but I think that one of the opportunities is also to include um, the Spanish connection to New Orleans. I'm sorry, let me go back here. Uh, so let me go back here. And I wanna show you also another element of this particular uh, class that is uh, extremely well done. And it was put together very well, here it is. And it is the timeline as well. So, um, This we go back to at various points in this module and it's a timeline that shows the different dates. So if they do not, um, all of it in Spanish, once again, we're only in the third week of class, but they can see the relationship a lot. Many of our students learn visually. And that's the thing. When we talk about diversity, um, about race and gender, 
I think one of the elements also has to do with neurotypical and neuroatypical. That's one of the elements of diversity that interests me personally. How do students that are not neurotypical acquire language? And one of those ways is through visual learning. And so this was an opportunity to allow them um, also to see a description and writing. So they are using their reading skills as well as their um, listening skills in the video. So this particular module, let me go back, highlights New Orleans um, history, but also we have another video in which I talk about the connection between Spain and New Orleans. And what I would, I'm gonna add one thing, if we were not uh, living in COVID times, my students would actually go into the city. One of my most memorable um, classes when I was a freshman at Harvard was a writing class and we had to go out and find different monuments in the city. So in other words, how do we make that connection between what we're seeing, what we're learning? I'm a little spaced out so I didn't really pick up all those details and what does it have to do with me anyways? You send them out into the city with a writing assignment with some sort of um, pedagogical assignment that they would do. In this case, it's a scavenger hunt where they would go to different parts of New Orleans and find different markers that is done over the period, say, of two weeks or three weeks so that they can cover that in the city. So the videos are the setup for the modules. They introduce um, the students to the topic that they're covering, but they are very carefully crafted. Each one of these videos includes the vocabulary and the um, grammar. In other words, those communicative goals, the proficiency goals. Communicative goals are how do we want our students to communicate in this module? What do we want them to be able to do? So using the past tense to talk about the history of New Orleans, using descriptive adjectives to talk about the connection to Spain. Now, let me actually jump forward um, and show you another one in module four, because that's the history of New Orleans. And of course, my hope is that they will make connections to say a course they're taking in architecture with Richard Campanella or another course in history about slavery or in African and Africana studies. So that's where the connection and the culture come in as we're teaching them language. Now, the next one is in module four and it has to do with shopping. And all of our students, most of them like to go at some point to magazine. It's in module four, let me move down here. Module four and okay, shopping in the city. Here it is, okay. So in this particular um, video, we are using, asking for recommendations, we are making suggestions, which is a code linguistically for using the subjunctive, okay? So what are we doing here? And I wanna also highlight um, that this is where this is filmed, which is giving us very nice lighting, which is in the Middle American Research Institute, which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, Hola, ¿deseas ir de compras en New Orleans? Pues hoy vamos a explorar varios lugares a donde puedes ir si necesitas comprar algo cerca de tu ley. Por ejemplo, si deseas comprar ropa, te sugiero la calle Magazine como punto de partida. Aquí encontrarás una selección diversa de boutiques y pequeños negocios que venden todo tipo de cosas. Puedes comprar una gran variedad de ropa para estéticas diferentes, zapatos, chocolate, joyería, antigüedades y hasta disfraces y pelucas para Mardi Gras. Okay. And it goes on and on. It talks about Whole Foods. I mean, if the budget had been unlimited and we weren't limited in COVID, we would actually have gone to these places, but we were, once again, it is exorbitantly expensive to make these videos. And so the best solution was to incorporate different stills that we talk about in class as we break down the videos that highlight different locations across the city. 
um, different shops that are unique and of interest you know, to the students because they have already participated in a discussion group about what type of shopping they like to do. So that was their pre um, viewing exercise. Now it is a little strange that I'm standing in front of a Maya um, hieroglyphic panel, but they the, the it was filmed the same day that I filmed a series of videos introduced um, interviewing the director and collections manager at Mari and the uh, the director liked the lighting a lot. So we stayed in there and it actually I mean it it looks very nice. And I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying that uh, communicating that students should uh, purchase antiquities or anything of the case, anything like that. So um, then what they do for every module, okay, you'll ask, okay, so what, what comes out of these videos? You talk about them, so what? We have a discussion board in each module, which has replaced the very mundane and boring essays that students often write, writing prompts. I have a 13 year old, so you hear a lot about writing prompts and they write this essay and that's it. What I found was one of the great gifts of shifting online was the discovery of the discussion board as a means of teaching writing. And so the students, and this, this is actually um, a medium through which students that are somewhat shyer in class and apprehensive about speaking in class can use writing to communicate uh, with their fellow students. So it's not the same skill, but there is communication going on in writing. So in this case, in the, of the city, they talk about um, their, own favorite city, they talk to each other, I intercede, etc. So we address the writing in that format. Now, this, we also have an exit ticket, which is a formative assessment, not a summative. What does that mean? Formatives are short one question quizzes that test for comprehension. You're making sure your students understand what it is they're learning. Summative, as in sumare, summa, everything. That's your midterm and your final. In language acquisition, it's very important to combine both of them. So sometimes we have two exit tickets, sometimes three, but they are very short, one question um, quizzes, if you will, that allow us to see if our students are grasping what we want them to grasp and if it aligns with our pedagogical goals. Now, I, I wanna focus your attention on the second module, which has nothing to do with um, our book, but it is something that Tulane offers um, in a very strong way, which is the connection to Latin America and the connection to um, pre-Hispanic cultures. So in, I'm sorry, it's actually module three. So we do a whole, a whole module on pre-Hispanic and the pre-Columbian um, past. We focus on Maya, Aztec, and Inca. There's a reading, of course, there's a short film for every module, but for me, what is truly the highlight here, and let me make sure I get the right, um, here we go. All right, a prepararse la cultura Maya. And this is a, is a variation, okay, of what you see where it's just me talking, because that can get a little bit, if you don't break it down, it's a little overwhelming and it's not a conversation. What does it mean to show students a conversation? So there are a series of three different videos in which I talk to, excuse me, there are four actually. I talk to the director of the uh, Middle American Research Institute and then to his collections manager. Why do this? It shows students that might be interested in anthropology, might be interested in indigenous cultures, might be interested in archeology, span what we have to offer. Mari is a jewel at Tulane that not many people know about. It's a very small gallery compared to say NOMA or MoMA or any of the big museums that is very manageable for our classes. We used to go there in person, but we can't do it now with COVID. What does this mean? This means that we can reach students who are not in, in New Orleans with some of our offerings. So we've showcased New Orleans, now we're showcasing Tulane, just a little snippet. And you'll notice a, one, a difference in this video from the other ones. Quisiera hacerte algunas preguntas generales sobre los antiguos mayas. Por ejemplo, ¿dónde se encontraban sus templos y sus ciudades? La civilización maya se encuentra en los países modernos de México, Guatemala, Belice y Honduras. 
Y para hablar de los antiguos mayas, podemos hablar de ciertas fechas, un marco temporal. Sí, normalmente hablamos de la cultura maya empezando 2000 años antes de Cristo hasta hoy en día. Son más casi 4000 años de una cultura. Increíble. Okay. It goes on uh, it goes on for another two minutes. This is also broken down. Now, you'll notice that there are no subtitles here which is different from the other texts where we did have subtitles. There's a reason for this. Number one, this is an actual conversation that I'm having with the director. It's not scripted, it's not staged. I told him, um, I basically told him what it is that uh, we would be talking about. And aside from that is an actual true conversation. And I wanted students at this point, which is already in the, this is, would be in the fifth week of the semester, to have some exposure to non-scripted and non-subtitled um, target language. So there are two videos, two in interviews with uh, Marcello, and then two interviews with his collection manager, uh, who talks about some of the collection. I don't want to run over, so I'm going to jump um, into the Tulane canvas. So let me just go back to module three here um, for a second. There is a, hold on, so the modules, module five. I want to also highlight the campus itself for students who might not be here yet, say they are in China and they haven't been able to get into the US, um, but they're hoping to have their second year be here um, on campus, maybe they're going to wonder where they need to go for certain things. So in module five right here, we talk a bit about, here it is, um, where you go for certain needs at Tulane. And it's combined once again with the use of the future and the conditional. So what we call C clauses. Okay, let me go back to the beginning. I have to ask, is that the official jingle for Tulane? It's just, no, it's just the music that they use. Okay. And the topic of this module is the workforce, preparing for work. How does Tulane prepare its students for work? Where do you go if you want advice? Once again, carefully crafted using the future and the conditional. Um, si quieres tener éxito en el mundo laboral, hay algunas cosas que probablemente harás mientras estás en tu ley. Por ejemplo, temáticas o economía. Si quieres ser actor o actriz, estudiarás teatro. O si quieres ser arqueólogo, te enfocarás en antropología. Tulane tiene una gran variedad de posibles especialidades, desde química, biología y matemáticas, a estudios ambientales, comunicaciones y literatura. Tulane también tiene un programa excelente de estudios latinoamericanos, por si decidirás enfocarte en Latinoamérica. Encontrarás este programa en el Stone Center for Latin American Study. We'll move forward because we talk about... Si quieres ser pintor, pintarás mucho para mejorar tu arte. Igual si tu deseo es... So it's an overlap. I go through different buildings. We talk about different buildings. Newcomb Hall. We talk about art. We talk about Jones Hall. Different locations. Gibson and uh, Dimwitty. So that say you're a student that has never set foot on campus because of COVID or because you're, are, you're abroad and COVID is over and you haven't been able to come. You're taking this in the summer. You will have some familiarity with the campus. We work with a campus map as well in terms of moving around the campus. So it is a way um, to, I don't want to say sell because I, I, I think that we're, you know, we all promote the university or um, our institution in certain ways, but I just feel that it is an opportunity, a chance to educate the students and tell them about the offerings once again. Um, so this is uh, the module in which we address that. Now, in order to close, I wanna go back to my PowerPoint. Um, if there's time for questions. And just, you're, you're probably gonna say, okay, so what do we do with these videos? Um, let me make sure that you can see this. 
share screen. Okay. So we have a series, as I said, of previewing and post viewing activities. So some of the elements that I have worked on with my class, um, previewing, you're tapping into information that the students already have. When we're talking about cities, we're asking them about which cities are you familiar with? What's your favorite city? All of this, of course, to bring out their foundational knowledge in the target language. They watch the videos, they do the exercises, they do the sequencing, which also we have many activities that correspond to the films that are incorporated into the course as well. Um, but some of the elements that we do to wrap it all up, to do a post viewing activity, concept maps. This is one of the elements that I truly love where they actually work in groups and they draw out once again, tapping into visual learners, different themes and concepts that emerge in the module, in the videos, in the films, in the readings. What happens next? In other words, if um, there is a conversation like the one that I'm having with Marcello and Mari, what happens after we finish that video? Do we go to lunch? Students can create, once again, a narrative that continues that. They can act out, for example, in the video in which I um, highlight different buildings on campus that serve different functions for the students. They can act out a visit to Musafir Hall, to advising, to the Career Center. Um, they can also tell the, se tell the future instead of telling the, the past. They can write a sequel to any of the videos or to any of the films. So these are some ideas um, as to how you might be able to incorporate the general idea and driving force behind um, the modules. What I wanna leave you with is this idea that the organization, the idea of communicating with our students, building a language program that will work equally well online through Zoom and in person. And how can we use all of the offerings that we have around us at Tulane and in New Orleans in order to attract students to brand the university, sell it, and attract donations, attract students, attract uh, faculty, et cetera. I think that it's a wonderful opportunity that serves many different functions. And we're lucky to have, you know, to be here. And why not use that to engage the students, given particularly and especially that they, how should I put it, they focus best whenever the information and what's being communicated to them is directly related to their lives. And so that's what we tap into, but we do it on a level that is, uh, I think, multifaceted. It's almost if we have a concept, it has many different umbrellas that are going out. So it, it's, it's a course that hopefully in the fall will also be the core for all of the Spanish 2030 sections. That is, that's the course. So we have over a thousand students enrolled per semester. And this will be available to all of the instructors to use after I tweak a few things um, in the fall semester. That's the goal. So I want to leave you with that. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions um, and uh, any comments or suggestions. Charles. Hi. Well, uh, first of all, congratulations. That looks like you know an amazing work. I'm very, very happy about that. So as you know, I also like uh, have a, my own textbook, like so my own modules called French in New Orleans. And how do you get professional videos? Because my videos are me with my <laughs> with my iPhones uh, filming students, you know, so it's kind of the same idea, but more for 10, 10, 10, 20. But so did you uh, contact uh, Jamie Northrop or did you like, how did you get the, the project? This was a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I was very fortunate to just be asked to develop the course. There were some courses that they wanted to develop to access, you know, uh, foreign students, summer students, um, and students that couldn't be on campus. But I do think that, and this is what I had in mind, and this is what's so ironic about it, back in March, this is what I wanted to do was go around with my iPhone on a selfie stick and you know move around New Orleans. And this was before COVID got so bad, right? And that you really couldn't go anywhere, you couldn't film or you had to be so careful. So I do think that this model is reproducible. 
um, in the sense that you can, I mean, there are so many different uh, support elements that we can use for our phones, you know, filming ourselves cooking, filming ourselves, you know, walking around the French Quarter. And what I really wanted to do, I, in French, you have so much in our city that you're connected to. And I feel often that people forget or don't even know about the history, the connection to Spain, right? Which was sort of at, at two points that interrupted the, you know, the French control of this area. And so I saw this once again as a way to take them to the Cabildo, take them to, you know, show them that the architecture in the French Quarter isn't that ironwork is Spanish, right? The plaza, the organization of the French Quarter, the central, you know, Jackson Square, that organization is actually based on the Spanish, you know, plaza. So I, you know, I do think it's reproducible. I think that, um, you know, the, and once again, we had to be very careful. Ideally, I would have liked to have conversations with many different people, but COVID doesn't, I'm in the high risk group. So I had to be especially careful um, just health wise. So that's why I couldn't have as many conversations with people. Just uh, a comment if I may, because I thought about that as well, because you know, I transfer everything online as well, like some module and everything, but I still kept the a PDF format of your activities, just in case they want to print out and handwrite it. And some students like were happy about that to be able to handwrite because they're so tired of looking at the screen. So I'm thinking it could be an easy fix, you know, just like to uh, have a PDF, but as an alternative and basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. But I and, really, and also I, writing, I just want to add this. I learned this from one of my students who's a neuroscience major, because I've always noticed that when students write, it, it sticks. I mean, it's this is what I did when I was a language student as an undergraduate in French and Italian. I would sit down and just write verbs out. And I always tell my students that that's how you acquire that knowledge of you know actions and verbs and it's the brain you use more parts of your brain whenever you're writing and so in order to you know flashcards i find useless when it comes to you know verbs and and even vocabulary sometimes it doesn't necessarily stick for lack of a better word the way we want it to vocabulary is a whole nother issue that's a whole nother talk how to teach vocabulary but i think that i think you're absolutely right we cannot do away with writing and it's not the same to type as it is to write out by hand. And so all of our classes do incorporate writing as well. Um, because I think there is a danger there if everything just goes online. And the temptations are great. Technology is there, but I feel that technology and social media, it's there. And so we have to make peace with it and incorporate it into our teaching. In other words, the Instagrams, the translation software, all of these issues, we have to use it as a tool rather than you know, tell students, you can't use this, you can't use that, you're cheating, you're gonna be reported because this is the world we live in now, right? And so that's the way I feel about social media too and, and all of that. But writing, writing by hand is still very important. They don't even teach cursive anymore in schools. It's crazy. I don't know how you sign a check. I guess maybe there aren't gonna be checks anymore you know, in a little while, but or documents. I mean, how do you, you know, you sell your house. How do you sign, I guess you sign it. Lynn, you had a question and Chaya. Uh, yes, um, thank you Roxanne for your amazing um, presentation. I really like this, this carefully designed uh, modules on Canvas. Um, and the videos are very nicely made. Um, I just um, I just want to make, first make a comment before I ask a question. So um, your idea of linking Spain of uh, with with the French influenced, uh, France influenced New Orleans together. I think it's it just gives me this idea. It it enlightened me in a way because um, I I struggle to look for a connection between China and New Orleans uh, sometimes when I teach and I want to do that. So uh, it just came up to me that what I can do is actually um, so I grew up in Shanghai and it actually has a, a French concession, which is the like a French quarter in Shanghai. Um, so uh, it just came up to me that I can actually link that part of history uh, to our curriculum here um, in, in, in our Chinese class. So I think that's amazing. And um, my question is about writing. So you talk about uh, you you dislike the idea of, you know, giving students a prompt to write a 500 word essay. Um, and instead, you want them to have discussion on this discussion board, right? So, um, but writing on the discussion board is not strictly the same as writing a 500 essay. So how can you 
kind of make up for that um, in terms of like training students to write genre specific so specific essays um, in, in class? That's yeah. a great question. And, and I think that we're talking about different registers, right? Linguistic okay. registers. So we're looking at, 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 at writing on a discussion board and how they communicate with each other on WhatsApp and what is it, Snapchat and Instagram and all of these different, and just text in general. It's a different medium, right? It's a different type of language that we use on each one of those, the discussion board. Whereas if they have to sit down and write a formal letter, they're looking for a job in Latin America, which is Spanish is extremely Baroque. It's full, it's, there's, a, there's a very unique and special way in which you write formal professional letters. We do include those um, more often in the upper level, 2040 and 3040 level. 3040 is our writing course and 2040 takes us beyond. What we do have in this course is that in their exams, they do have formal writing. And then also they do a writing project. They do a creative project in which they write a children's story because mm -hmm. that is the level. And they're, that some of the production is, cre is, is absolutely incredible. The art that they create, the way they link together all of the different, um, the syntax, the grammar, the vocabulary, all of this. And then of course, why do this if we're not gonna publish it? There has to be an end result for the students, a goal. So it will. It appears my students publish it on Instagram. There's an Instagram site where they can, you know, they, they post to this page and they share their short stories and their other venues. But back to your original question of like an essay prompt, we do have those on, uh, on the exams. And I, I find that the discussion board replaces what used to be like these blog posts or like diary entries, which really the students were sort of struggling with because it's very, it's, it's kind of retro. I mean, I hate to say that because this dates me, but like in the nineties and 2000, you know, it's, well, that's really, you know, modern. We're writing a blog post or, you know, even in the early 2000s. Now the students are used to this type of discourse on Facebook, right? I think we need to look at, once again, at social media and what is most relevant directly to their lives. How do they communicate and put that in as our short term writing, you know, writing uh, exchanges, and then also have the more summative, the more the essays, how do we train them to write? I personally think that all departments should have writing courses in which students are trained also how to write academically. Because all we do, you know, there's a lot of complaining about how students write, they don't write, and then you add to that a foreign language. I, we can't complain about the students if we don't teach them how to write. I mean, that's on us, all of us. I mean, and, and I include, you know, faculty that are teaching literature, tenure line faculty as well, because it's, we, the students are here to learn. We are the ones that are responsible for, for teaching them. So, um, Shaida, did you have a question? Yes, I have, first I have a comment. This, this presentation just blew me away. I am very excited. Um, and you're gonna teach it in the fall, yeah. <laughs> so. Yes, um, I've been, actually, I've been using the module since last semester, after I took the class with, with Kelt. And it's, uh, I want to do a testimony. It improved a lot because we use a flip model mm -hmm. and that really makes it very clear to students that if they follow the modules, how they have to prepare, how they have to come up with some exercise, la la la, and how they come to class prepare. And it helped my classes. I, incredibly, especially when they have to do um, cultural, which used to be dry land for anybody. I mean, we were islands <laughs> back in the day, but now you get these modules in which you give them pictures, videos, music. You have all, you know, they, they can pick. They don't have to do all of them. They can just choose and they all have a flavor of what we're gonna discuss in class. It's enriched greatly. So I am really, um, I am really happy and I can I can't wait to use Great, this. wonderful. Yeah. And I will I didn't mention that that we do flipped. And it's interesting because flipped, we've been doing flipped classrooms since the 90s. It's just that it, it, they get renamed, right? It's like now it's flipped classroom. Yeah. You know, communicative language teaching is based on the students preparing ahead of yeah. time. And then you lead them through the steps. The, the inductive steps where they're communicating and then you arrive at the rules at the end. Yes. The, the 
the way we communicate that has shifted and changed a bit, but it's the same principle. So the, everybody talks about flipped classroom as being so new. It's really, it's not that new. It works. I always thought it under, under it. I mean, if you were not prepared for class, that's on you. Then you get there, you don't know. And professors will not have any problem telling you that when you have a question to tell you go back and read the book. I if mean, you I, I, your yeah. history class or your literature seminar, then yes. you don't, you know, you, you no. don't participate in class. So why is that any different from language? You prepare yeah. for class, yeah. you know, so, um, but yeah, that's why I can't wait for, for you to try them. So Alexandra, Alex. Oops, I can't hear you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, the, the great uh, brown bag lunch. Great job. Second, I'm sorry that I was blacked out, but my battery is super hot and my computer is about to, uh, I feel, explode. So I will turn up, turn off the camera as soon as I'm done. Uh, I just wanted to um, comment on Lynn uh, when you asked about writing and also tie that to what you just said, Roxanne. Uh, we kind of need to keep in mind what students like to work with so or what they are reading um several years back what i did is and it functions in every single language class i had them create a website and so it was a formative assessment throughout the entire semester because it was a semester project and i did it on weebly and so and i based it also on a new orleans pro, uh, on a new orleans topic and so this way i tied the new orleans topic every single time to the individual chapters. So formative assessment throughout the semester because I could provide feedback whenever I looked at the website that was created throughout the entire semester. So it was growing. And then at the end of the semester, actually they had to present and it was part of their oral exam. They had to present their website, their project, mm -hmm. and the attendees in the class, they had to listen, formulate questions, and then ask the questions. So to some extent, the students were prepared, of course, for what was coming, but they didn't, of course, not know the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, questions that were asked. And then out of that resulted a final paper. So they had to write up uh their project so it was all modes of communication were practiced throughout the semester and that really helped to um yeah uh, address all visual learners or all different kinds of intelligences all different kinds of learning styles writing was an essential part and the students really felt that they were working with the language they were producing language and as you said roxanne it was published in the end right because it was a published product so uh that worked really really well and i did it in a one uh in a 101 class so 10 10 and i did it later in a 2030 class and it, it you just have to then adjust for the level and you have to adjust of course your expectations Right, exactly. I think that's great. And I, I just, I find it, as I say, so important to engage with the world yeah. we're in. And, and I think what makes these modules unique, if I may say so, is that they're designed also, and hopefully will be successful at reaching students who can't be here on campus, right? And this became extremely clear. I had a student who was in Africa, I had to go back you know, to Africa, students that are even on the West Coast, if you're teaching at 9 a.m. or you yeah. have an 8 a.m. class, those students are up at 6 a.m. A student you know, strangely went to Hawaii in the middle of COVID because the flights were very cheap in late March, <laughs> early, you know, early April and was trying to log. I, I, I see this as a way that have everything organized and to, reach those students, particularly yeah. foreign students. And we want a, a diverse population, you know, here. We want to have, you know, students from abroad as well as, you know, students from all the different states. So I think it's a way to, you know, to introduce Tulane, hopefully, you know, it'll, it'll amount to that. So that, those were my goals, you know, so. And if when I can send them out into the city, that's great. It won't strain, it won't change the module structure, but it's even I think more relevant because they can go out and breathe and see and hear and feel New Orleans, right? I mean, New Orleans is a city that you engage with with all your senses, right? So, I mean, no Mardi Gras this year was just a completely different, 
you know, the Mardi Gras that, you know, I show my students are the shoes behind me. It's like, that's it. So, um, Vicky. Yeah, I know the lunch is technically over, but just um, real quick. Oh, it's time for you. <laughs> um, there seems to be a tension, right? Because like on one hand, you've done such a deft job of like weaving yourself into the course and people getting to know you through the videos. And on the other hand, like I'm thinking about like, you know, you're talking about students accessing this and I'm thinking like, what about all the other 20, 30 language teachers? And like, would there be things that they can use when they're not in the classroom? Or, you know, one of the things that has always like saddened me maybe is that all the language teachers who are teaching three classes a semester and are coming in four days a week, could some of this modules be used to help faculty like get a day at home, right? <laughs> like, Absolutely. Four days, like teach at home for a day and I don't know like would you be able to I mean would you suggest then faculty use make their own videos or like are there certain parts that are transferable like you put a sorry my friend shit ton of work into this so like you know uh you know what 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 is transferable to the other 20, 30 teachers? What should they do on their own? What should they, like, is there gonna be like a hierarchy of like when, what things should be done in the classroom? We're all gonna be in person again, right? So mm -hmm. what what can we keep on? That's my question. I think, I think that's a great question and I'm glad you asked it. I didn't even think of it because it's so clear in my mind, like how I conceive of this. All of this is transferable. In other words, when you go on YouTube and you look at some of the best, um, pedagogically geared videos, there is one person, sometimes two people that are talking about themselves. In other words, it, the information about me is not so personal that it's not relevant. It's all, and as I say, all of these were scripts that I wrote that went through many drafts. I had my assistant, my graduate assistant, she actually helped me edit them all. So it was a long process in which they're carefully constructed to include vocabulary, um, you know, the, the grammar, the syntax, all of that so that they will be relevant. Otherwise, why do this, right? I mean, it's a lovely idea, but it has to be transferable to every single 20, 30 section. So the idea is, and I wanna throw in also the asynchronous too, the element of asynchronous teaching, um, is that in the fall, everybody will use these modules. Yes, I am the one talking, but, and that's, un, you know, it's unfortunate that you have to see so much of me and I don't, as I say, <laughs> it is what it is, but, you know, they're usable in every single class and section. And this will allow, hopefully alleviate, ideally what I would like down the road because everybody will be having this exact same class, it standardizes it, is that we could rotate discussion groups amongst our different instructors. So you have a section with one instructor who's from Cuba one week, you have a section with another instructor from Mexico, from Peru. That not only um, creates parity in the sense that we different you know, input into evaluation. But I think something that's extremely important with the Spanish language and with any language, we have variations, regional variations. And the first time you hear Caribbean Spanish, if you're used to Colombian or Mexican Spanish, it's like a foreign language. And I would love to expose students. It And it creates once again, this sort of equality that everybody is having exposure. The new instructors, it helps them learn, right? As they see, because one of my, one of the things I do um, in the program is mentoring for graduate students. We pair them up also with more, um, more advanced teachers, but how can we also, before plopping our graduate students in the classroom, how can we let them see? The modules also serve a function for the methodology course because you know they can be used to teach our graduate students and our new instructors ideally how to teach. It is a lot harder to teach basic language well than it looks. In other words, it is, and once again, these are the classes that our new students have the most contact with. We have to have top-notch instructors. This and math, 
you know, I mean, these are the ones they come in, they don't know yet what they want to concentrate in. And, and we're the face of the university it has to be done really well. You know, so I think, yeah, that, definitely transferable. Thanks, and, Roxanne. And Thank also, for Thank you. Anyone else? Alex, you have one more question? Oh, maybe not. She's gone. So if any, no, 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 not a question, just oh, a sure. comment again to the transferability, Vicky. Um, especially I used in all of my classes discussion boards, and that brings us back to Lynn, to the writing and to what Roxanne said earlier. Um, the discussion boards, that is definitely something that can be done in every single class, whether it is the tights course, it is an honors colloquium, it is a language course. And uh, if you enhance those discussion boards with uh, mind mapping, or you enhance them with short video clips, that, as I did in my senior seminar, where they had to comment on um, interviews, set the interview in relation to texts discussed in class. I mean, that can done can be done asynchronously, so that could uh, take away one day of instruction in the classroom one or it if it is not as comprehensive then it could uh just be used as a homework assignment can i add one more thing about asynchronous just before we close i think that i think that one of the great gifts of covid has shown us how important the learning outside of the classroom can be in a context like this with these modules and i and we're doing this in all of our language classes um as of the fall we have one asynchronous day um, every week. So one of our classes is asynchronous. Now, what does that mean? That the students can just go and sleep in and not do anything? No, it means that this is an opportunity for them to engage with the community, to go out and do projects, to participate in discussion groups, to engage. If you can't go into the community, the community can come to you. They have projects online where they do research, where they watch, you know, uh, not my videos, but for example, with Mexico City, when we're talking about the city, we have a whole series of activities where they actually go through Google Maps and find different monuments um, in Mexico City, et cetera. So it is a, it's, it's, I think the asynchronous is, is not only a gift to the instructors who are teaching, you know, three classes that meet four days a week, technically, but that it's a way to relearn how we teach as well, to reconceptualize what it means and what students are capable of outside of the classroom and to take advantage, once again, of New Orleans, of Tulane. There's a scavenger hunt that my students also do on campus, right? Where is the, you know, these different buildings that they don't know about, right? Where's the Newcomb Gallery? Where is the Dean of, you know, SLA located? In other words, so that they, and they're doing it all in a foreign language. So they're learning about their own surroundings on an asynchronous day, but in Spanish, and then they have to produce something. Always there has to be an end result, right? Because otherwise, who cares? So what, right? Whether it's, so I think, I think that the asynchronous day is, is, is something wonderful that has been given to us on all levels because it, it allows for creativity whenever we create these courses without losing contact time because language, language is about constant contact with that language, right? So, you know, that's, that's the way I see it. Any other questions? Thank you so much for being here, all of you. I appreciate it. Yes, thanks everyone. I'm so glad that we're able to do these uh, as monthly as possible sessions. <laughs> um, just to put a note on your calendars that we are going to have one more before the end of the semester. Um, Lynn is going to be talking to us about writing projects um, on April 8th at noon. And I will send out another email. And um, It's always the same link. So please join us if you can. And I will always put the recordings up on our new LLC website if you can't make it. Thank you. Thanks so much. De nada, chao. Chao. Richard, do you have a minute afterwards? Just one. Okay. Want to hit and record, Roxanne? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank I'll you. I'll talk to you later. It being done automatically.